This podcast was recorded on 7 June, 9 a.m. Monday morning, Jakarta time. Things may have changed by the time you heard this. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to Reformasi Dispatch. I'm Jeff Hutton, regional correspondent for the Straits Times of Singapore. And I'm Kevin O'Rourke from Reformasi Weekly. It's Monday morning. Got a full slate. Got a great pod for you today. We've got Ganjar Pranowo, governor of Central Java, came on yeah. the pod. Yeah, super uh, interview with uh, Pat Ganjar, who uh, uh, spoke uh, very broadly on all sorts of topics and uh, got into some detail and was really forthcoming. So, the, um, I, My takeaway from that was, um, I think, the, the most salient uh, question, and hopefully it didn't get cut, Stephen, was um, my question about his favorite program on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Turns out he is, he is a connoisseur of prestige TV. It's not Netflix for him. It's, it's, it's HBO. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> about, that's the key takeaway. Um, no, I came, I, I came away from that thinking, wow, this guy has got energy. He has got it in, in truckloads. Um, he was, he's definitely ready for prime time. Yeah. And, um, yeah, along those lines, uh, I was struck by the, uh, the difference over time since he started in that role eight years ago as governor until now, he's, uh, really made strides, um, in a lot of different ways, especially just, uh, yeah, yeah as you mentioned, his readiness, um, he, he's, he's really uh, on the ball, I think. Yeah, it's really sure. Of course, he came into the job. He was elected into the job after um, his predecessor was nabbed by the KPK. Is that right? I mean, he started off with a definite a job to do, cleaning up governance. Yeah, Central Java had a poor governor before him. That was Bibit Waluyo, who was one of the last of the army generals to serve in a gubernatorial post. I mean, there's actually one in North Sumatra now. I mean, there's been a few here and there, but he was sort of one of the old school generals, I should say, and Bibit Waluyo clashed quite openly and, and quite harshly uh, at the time with Joko Widodo, who was the uh, solo mayor underneath the governor uh, in those days. Right. Well, coming up on the pod, we've got a COVID-19 update. Um, Jakarta's waste to energy project goes up in smoke. Prabowo goes shopping. But first, Golkar has said all are welcome in terms of, of a potential BP slot. Now, this is really interesting because in light of Pranowo's dust-up with CDIP leadership, namely uh, Ibu Megawati and um, her daughter, Puan Maharani, they have more or less poo-pooed the idea of Pranowo getting any sort of nod to, for a presidential run. And now with, with Golkar saying that uh, all options are on the table, it looks like they might be able to swoop in to uh, steal a little bit of PDIP's thunder. That's right. Yeah, this uh, speculation or, or this uh, news arose amid speculation about Ganjar immediately after both Puan and Megawati seemingly slighted him in public. Puan snubbed him at an event last month. And then uh, after that, Megawati made a very harsh comment about how cadres who do too little for the party are unwelcome in PDIP. Ganjar definitely agreed wholeheartedly that cadres should contribute to the party and, and he agrees with Megawati. But uh, most people are reading Megawati's statement as impugning Ganjar and therefore further diminishing prospects for PDIP to nominate him for president, even though he's by far their most popular potential nominee. Uh, but we've discussed that in the past. So then what happened is that uh, Ahmad Dali Kornia, one of Golkar's vice chairs, was asked about this whole thing and, and about whom Golkar would put on its ticket. And he said, with reference to the vice presidential slot, uh, all names are open and under consideration because Golkar is committed at, at the moment, ostensibly to nominating its chair, Erlanga Hartarto, for president. But that's just kind of a, a ruse for now, that the sort of a fiction that they need to adhere to for internal reasons for the moment. Uh, it's really doubtful that Hartarto would be at the head of a ticket at the end of the day because his popularity is just not anywhere near the same league as numerous other names out there, including Ganjar. 
so it just shows that Golkar is receptive to Gunjar, and that's important uh, because that would be a, a really powerful combination there, Golkar and Gunjar. Ideologically, is Golkar a reasonable home for Pranoa? Yes, because uh, Golkar's ideology is getting power. Uh, that's what they believe in. <laughs> yeah. So they'll uh, accommodate yes. themselves uh, okay. to pretty much anybody who could uh, reasonably deliver that for them. And, um, you know, there, there are limits. There's, there are some ideological uh, limits that they wouldn't cross, I think. But uh, And Genjar, you're right, is, is, is an awkward fit with the party. Um, you know, they, they don't really share a lot in common going back. But generally, ideology is not the real driver in, in these political alignments in Indonesia so far. In the course of its democratization, it's more about you know, old school patronage on one hand and uh, reform and democratization on the other hand. And that's the that's where the battle lines are drawn, and that's why it's awkward. Ganjar is a reformist, and most of or a lot of Golkar is very much not reformist. Erlanga Hartarto is a bit of an exception, but he has to deal with these wings in the party, especially figures like Abriz Al Bakri and especially Bambang Susatio. Remind me, what has um, Ganjar done to deserve this, to deserve the the wrath, the, the wrath of, of uh, Ibu Mega that seems particularly vitriolic, and more so than it was with we'll, we'll Joko. Right. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard to know for sure, but this is a recurring theme, and it may be something that is really nettlesome to Megawati more so than ever, namely her own paramount position in the party being rivaled or undermined by an, a seeming upstart who comes from obscure origins. So this first happened with uh, Cecilia Bamangiriono, who was her coordinating politics and security minister in 2004. And he left the cabinet claiming to have been uh, insulted by Megawati's husband and then immediately formed his own mounted his own bid and unseated Megawati that year in the uh, presidential election. And then again, with Joko Wee, Megawati was very reluctant to nominate him for president, but at the very last minute, she finally acceded to that. Uh, and this time, I think she sees Ganjar Pranowo as doing something very similar as Joko Widodo. So you would think that she might be more amenable to it now, but I think that she's more concerned about promoting her daughter, Juan, and maybe feels very hard done by Joko Widodo and is unwilling to endure another experience of having nominated the president, but not having received sufficient benefits from that president. She might be right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, basically the priority is uh, herself, her family, Right. First and foremost, then the party. And so if, if the party needs to be smaller in order to preserve the family's paramount position, so be it. Okay, moving on to COVID. Roughly three weeks after the end of the Edo Fitri holidays, and the much feared acceleration of uh, COVID infections has yet to materialize. There's been an uptick, but not as much as we had worried. And just by basis of um, comparison, 20 days after the end of fetal Edel Petri, the seven-day moving average of infections is about 4,000 a day. By comparison, seven-day moving average is about triple that three weeks after Christmas. Um, so this is some good news. Yeah, um, it can always turn on a dime also. But uh, yes, there's been no real acceleration or momentum in cases uh, uh, so far, and Indonesia is not out of the woods yet. It's still within the the, the period of time which the um, holiday travel and uh, gatherings uh, may still impact uh, case growth after incubation periods. But yeah, uh, it's uh, looking a bit more hopeful every day. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go on a Reuters rant here? Right. There was a uh, article uh, describing. Unpublished surveys of seroprevalence uh, of COVID-19 antibodies in supposedly random samples uh, taken in, on two different occasions, one nationwide and another specifically in Bali province. And these showed uh, uh, reportedly, according to Rodius, very high levels of antibodies in the population, 15% in the nationwide survey and 17% in the Bali survey. 
And the headline was a little bit alarmist. It concluded that uh, COVID-19 is far more prevalent than official figures show. And then this lends to, it lends itself to interpretation as being that there's a cover up maybe, or at least that you know, the, the official data is unreliable and there's something else going on out there, or that uh, there's been this sudden change and uh, Indonesia is on the verge of a crisis. In fact, these surveys were done in uh, September, November, and December of last year, and one of them went into January of this year. Uh, so they're all at least you know, almost six months old. Um, so you know, if that high level of seroprevalence is true, a big if, even then you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's alarming because there's been this long elapse of time between then and now. So if anything, it's, it could arguably be positive news that there's a big swath of the population that has some immunity to uh, uh, COVID-19. But it does seem to miss one key point, and that's sort of you know, bed occupancy. And I don't know if it really makes plain the, 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 the underlying data. The underlying data is about exposure to a SARS-CoV-2 virus or a SARS-CoV-2-like virus. So you've developed the antibodies because of an exposure to something similar to SARS. And uh, this was six months ago, you say. So it says that you've been exposed and you've gotten over it, but not necessarily developed symptoms as evidenced by the symptoms that were at least sick enough to put you in hospital or worse. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and say it. There is a propensity among members of the media, and I understand it. They've they, they got to produce and they've got to go for something that will be read. But there is, there has been through all this a propensity among my tribe to want to really beat up on Indonesia. And I haven't been saying anything because India, right? I mean, just it can turn on a dime, as you say. And the government hasn't been particularly stellar. The, the reasons for the spread of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus isn't clear why it's been slower to spread here than in, say, India, which has, you know, you can see some similarities there. It's like it's an easier sell than it really should be. And I get a little frustrated. I, I, I think that actually it's not as bad so far, not as bad as it could be. And I think I, 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 would, I think that it deserves, that story deserves a, a bit more coverage. And something I've been able to do, and I'm very lucky in my position I'm, that, that the Straits Times actually gives me a lot of room to deep dive. I don't, I'm not, I don't have the pressure of, of deadlines per se, and maybe they do, and I understand it. You get this, but still, you've got to bear that out in the reporting. You, you, you've you got to show, like, this, this, gives us, this gives us a sliver of insight. There, here are the things we don't know, and I don't know this story justice. Sorry, Tom. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Tom uh, acknowledges that seroprevalence uh, surveys have shown a high incidence of antibodies in other populations, including in India. And in fact, there was one in Los Angeles, California, that showed comparable results to these surveys mentioned by Reuters. It's really, uh, it's it's the headline that kind of, uh, you know, which is, was apparent on uh, msn.com and that's what kind of sends people to the wrong conclusion. And when you read the actual story, you get a slightly different tone. But, you know, there's a lot of issues uh, with uh, seroprevalence tests to begin with. They have selectivity issues, which is, you know, they can be capturing antibodies for things similar to SARS-CoV-2. That you know, There's a lot of other things that are similar. There's a lot of coronaviruses uh, uh, circulating in the human population. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's... And then basically these uh, scientific surveys, these, uh, these things really need to be peer reviewed and very carefully scrutinized. There needs to be clear disclosure of the methodological processes. And um, none of that is available yet because these things are unpublished. So it's, it's really hazardous to jump to conclusions about the findings of a scientific survey when there's just so little um, you know, detail about it and that they're not peer reviewed or published yet. So it's, uh, 
it's also a little bit. Uh... Do you have any sense why, though? I mean, the infections three weeks out after a mass travel event when there's been gatherings. You care to posit a hypothesis? Why we're so far so? I don't want to jinx it, but you know, why so far so good? Why why are we a third of the level that we were at Christmas? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, there could be a few reasons. Um, I think uh, those other holidays. I think they kind of all more or less built one upon the other upon the other because we're talking about mid-August, late October, and then late December. Whereas uh, Edel Fitri was happening amid a plateau or even a decline uh, in a lot of parts of the country. Uh, another is that it, it was actually about more like 24 days after the uh, actual holiday itself when the peak of the growth occurred. And uh, in Indonesia, as of the, the date of our podcast here, that there were still a few days away from that. So uh, there's still time for the, the growth to show up. Uh, although during those holidays, there was already some upward momentum in the second week. And, and then we haven't seen that in the second week after uh, Edel Futri. Uh, the, other, the other thing I would point out is that unlike Independence Day and Maulid Muhammad and uh, Christmas, the Edel Futri holiday this year was a very long process because of those travel restrictions that were around the uh, the two-day holiday days themselves. So therefore, the the gatherings and circulation that occurred happened well before the holiday when the travel exodus happened. And then also a few days after the holiday, actually more like uh, instead of on the holiday days of 13, 14 May, it was more like 17, 18 May is when everybody was crowding onto buses and uh, trains. So uh, that, that could add another couple of days to the process. So that's why I think we're not quite out of the woods yet. But in terms of explanations, you know, screening is uh, the, the well, health protocols and then screening are the two obvious differences between this time around and the previous ones. Moving on to Prabowo. Last week, Koran Tempo reported that there's a presidential regulation that's suggesting that Defense Minister Prabowo Subianto is asking for 125 billion US dollars over three and a half years for defense spending. Now I've done some Googling. Three and a half years comes out to roughly $30 billion a year. And because I'm Canadian and I have an agenda, that is double Canada's defense spending. And Canada has a, has a GDP that's half again the size of Indonesia's. So that's, that strikes me as um, quite profligate. Well, when you put it on a share of GDP basis, it's exactly the same as the... Uh share of GDP spent on defense outlays in uh, another North American nation state, the United States. Wow. So it puts things really? in perspective. 3.2% of GDP is what it would be if you spread out the $125 billion over three and a half years. And that's exactly what the U.S. spends, 3.2% on defense outlays. That seems really rich. Is that sort of probable asking for a pony and hoping that uh, he'll, you know, hoping he'll get something? Or like, how serious is that? It seems serious because he stood up and defended it and said, you know, went on and on about how Indonesia's defense preparedness is antiquated and the strategic environment is changing. Yeah, but the arguments are not particularly compelling. Meanwhile, they seem completely divorced from the reality of fiscal problems that the, the country's facing right now. Uh, so... It is akin, in that sense, to the plan that Prabhu wanted to pursue for a gigantic uh, million hectare food estate in central Kalimantan, which was just a completely unreasonable proposal. Uh, and again, this is um, something that is just beyond the, the, the bounds of uh, rationality. Modernizing defense equipment um, is a worthwhile thing to do. It is necessary in a lot of ways, but... It should be a better process, and um, it sh should not be so haphazard. This uh, affects Indonesia's credibility because you know, a lot of uh, other countries around the world, when they have Indonesian officials come visit them to de discuss defense issues, <laughs> they're going to look back on this and, and wonder how seriously they should uh, be listening. Of course, this is off in, in the wake of the loss of um, the submarine that killed, uh, I think it was more, more than 50 crewmen. Um, yes. Does, does Indonesia need to to go shopping i mean do, it, does it have a problem with with, with aging hardware um well yeah it has a problem with aging hardware across the board i think a few exceptions here and there but the uh, urgency of the 
various options vary. And uh, the real priority should be on naval vessels. Uh, but instead, there's a lot of discussion of uh, hardware for the, the Army and the Air Force. So that's a problem. Uh, and then the other thing is that it's uh, not really a credible uh, arrangement because this idea came forth from the minister himself. I should point out it's a, it's a draft presidential regulation which leaked. So it's a very early stages of planning. This is not a done deal by any means. Uh, it would need the president to approve. And it would also actually, in this case, need parliament because it would affect the budget very mammothly. And uh, uh, pretty much every party in parliament uh, signaled resistance or skepticism to it. So, so it, it's, uh, it's pretty much dead in the water, uh, but it's, uh, it's just an indicator that uh, Prabowo has a very haphazard approach as minister, especially because there's a company, um, PT Technology Militaire, which Prabowo endorsed to do discussions on arms purchases with Russia a few months ago. And uh, that company is owned by a charitable foundation, which in turn is controlled by the defense ministry. But four commissioners on this company are members of Garindra, you know, the party that Prabowo chairs. And so that's a bit of a conflict of interest. And he was asked about that, and he said that it was a coincidence. I'm sure it was. So skeptical. I'm more of a glass half full kind of guy. I don't know. If mm -hmm, that absolutely. That. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I also I'm interested in the leakiness of this. Isn't that kind of interesting that um, this this leaked out is, and for you know for it to get to the point of a, of a draft bit of um, regulation means that I mean it had it had some backers, but somebody somebody threw it overboard. Yeah, exactly, um, and apparently um, uh, the. Uh, Four service chiefs who are supposed to be involved in procurement planning were unaware of this. So it's something that was uh, cooked up uh, within the ministry rather than engaging with uh, the service chiefs. And, uh, yeah, and then the fact that it uh, leaked means that there's somebody even within the ministry right under Parbolo, uh, seemingly, who uh, is uncomfortable with this, uh, which, uh, again, points to it being uh, just a, uh, a very ill-conceived thing from the outset. Yeah. Also, Indonesia's entire spending is something like a hundred billion dollars. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then yeah, and yet another aspect of this is that uh, some of the officials in the defense ministry sought to immediately downplay this uh, report by trying to claim that the spending wouldn't impact the state budget because it would happen off the budget, <laughs> which is even more outlandish. Okay, and finally. Well, from a garbage plan to um, to garbage burning, how about that? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, that's a segue for you. Yeah, yeah. from a garbage plan to uh, the garbage waste to energy projects, the uh, the Sunsu Central Java Waste to Energy Project has fallen through after planners uh, failed to hammer out a power purchase agreement and secure central government uh, a central government guarantee. Well. If it had gone through, it would have incinerated and turned into energy 2,200 tons of garbage a day coming out of Jakarta. That's, I did some Googling, and that's about a third of daily production. That would have been a very big deal, or taking a big chunk out of Jakarta's waste disposal problem. Why, why did this, why was this allowed to fall through? Yeah, this uh, looks to me as if it's just, just really. Uh, or management by multiple government entities, the cabinet, the state power company, PLN, and also the governor of Jakarta. This is something that the president uh, himself has been seeking to prioritize since he became governor back in 2013. And um, you know, to the credit of Fazi Bowo, it was actually Fazi Bowo, the previous Jakarta governor uh, more than a decade ago that had uh, sought to create four intermediate treatment facilities in four different zones of Jakarta to handle the waste rather than uh, shipping it over to neighboring Bekasi into a gigantic landfill there, Bantar Gebam. Uh, and uh, Widodo has uh, tried uh, as governor and then again as president, he issued uh, three successive presidential decrees seeking to prioritize and, and make these types of projects uh, urgent priorities. 
And there are 12 that are you know, nationwide that are still underway in, in various phases. One in Surabaya is up and running. Another in Semarang uh, is uh, close um, and also in Solo, but others are still very much just on the drawing board. And in Jakarta, these four facilities um, originally planned, three of them are, are very nebulous. And there's only uh, this Sunter project was the only one that had made quite a bit of headway and had a a foreign partner uh, and uh, likelihood of financing. And there were agreements with PLN and the provincial government about the price of power and the uh, tipping fee for the, the waste brought to the facility. But those agreements were not nailed down. They were not finalized. Um, they were agreed upon, but not formalized. And uh, there was a report a few months ago saying that PLN was seeking a $34 million confirmation fee or something like that from the uh, project developers, including the company from Finland, as well as a company owned by the provincial government. And uh, the company owned by the provincial government paid its share, but the, the company from Finland wanted to get the financing in place before it paid this commitment fee or whatever it's called. And the financing couldn't be in place because there wasn't a power agreement and there wasn't a power agreement because PLN was asking for the fee. So it was, you know, it was just chicken and an egg, and a, a three-dimensional chicken and an egg problem. And, and there was no uh, leadership on the part of the politicians, uh, from the president to the cabinet on down, to intervene and make sure that this thing happened. Was it? Why didn't it have the leadership when it's had so many uh, decrees from the president? Well, um, could be a few explanations. Uh, you can <laughs> take your pick, but... Uh, uh, it's there's a new energy minister, uh, Arafat Tasrif, and just recently he has come on board and affirmed plans to make PLN carbon neutral and to uh, shift away from coal and basically support renewables. But those are just sort of statements. There hasn't been a lot of uh, firm action yet by the ministry under him uh, to date. So uh, I fear that maybe this is something that was just uh, not uh yeah, garnering sufficient attention uh, at a high enough level in, in that ministry. Uh, but there could be nefarious uh, elements at work, too. Uh, there's a lot of mafia interests in the handling of waste. And uh, for the, the government to pay a tipping fee to this uh, facility right in Jakarta might have uh, taken revenue away from whoever it is who's uh, carting the waste all the way over uh, to Bekasi, which is quite a long trip. Uh, the, the government, I think, under the um, an earlier governor, Ahok, uh, took over that function itself. But who knows what the arrangement is there in, in the handling of this. So that, that might have been a, a factor. And then there's also the issue of uh, PLN always being reluctant to settle purchase power agreements uh, with renewable energy projects uh, or you know, unconventional energy projects like this one. Mm. So anyone out there, you know, listening to this, podcast who has some ideas for investment opportunities uh, for renewable energy or waste management, should they be discouraged at this news? Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, you know, sort of an ominous uh, sign that there's a uh, rupture between uh, the practice on one hand and the rhetoric on the other. Got it. Okay, when we come back, Kajapranova. Hi, listeners. So uh, this uh, episode, we tried something a little bit different and we conducted an interview in Bahasa, Indonesia with uh, Governor of Central Java, Ganjar Pranowo. Uh, so uh, our um, engineer and producer, Stephen Handoko, did the uh, translation and transcription, and he will read the answers of uh, Pat Ganjar translated into English. And uh, Jeff and I are uh, providing our uh, questions in English, for purposes of the podcast, the questioning did not pertain to the presidential race. He agreed to the interview on the proviso that uh, we talk about things other than the presidential race, uh, because it is a bit early for that. And we readily agreed. So with no further ado, here's the interview. 
Thanks again, Pat Governor, for agreeing to this interview. Uh, my first question is about the uh, conditions of COVID-19 in the province, uh, especially after the uh, Udo Fitri holiday recently. Can you update us on the trends in infections and also the efforts of the provincial government to uh, address the pandemic? Kevin, jadi kalau saya boleh menceritakan uh, setelah hari raya sudah kita prediksi bahwa yang terinfeksi COVID ada potensi akan meningkat. Dan hari ini peningkatan terjadi cukup tinggi di Kabupaten Kudus. Dan ada delapan kabupaten lainnya yang sekarang menjadi perhatian kami. Sehingga kita harus melakukan tindakan-tindakan khusus uh, meminta kepada para bupati dan wali kota untuk menyiapkan penambahan tempat tidur after the holiday, we have predicted that there will be a potential increase in COVID infection. And today, there's a significant increase in Kudus Regency. And there are eight other regencies that become our focus. We've asked the regions and mayors to prepare more beds. We've asked the regions and mayors to prepare more beds at ICU, at ICU, at the hospital and isolation center. We've also prepared additional nurses, doctors and medicines, because what's happening now in Kudus is that there's a significant leap. So the other regions near Kudus are used as a buffer so they can help people there. So if there are people infected, but the hospital in Kudus are full, they can be sent to a nearby city or to Samarang. For the province as a whole, there isn't a significant increase. The high increase is only in Kudus, Sragen, and Brebes regions. Okay, also uh, regarding uh, COVID-19, Pat uh, Gobro, can you explain the uh, impact that the pandemic has had on uh, livelihoods and um, poverty rates uh, in the province because of losses of livelihood? Oh ya, tentu saja, Kevin, Jeff. Pasti masyarakat terdampak karena ekonomi sudah pasti terganggu. Sehingga sejak ketika COVID ini masuk di bulan Maret, kami membuat program-program untuk membantu masyarakat seperti menghidupkan usaha-usaha kecil menengah dengan kita memberikan bantuan atau kita melaksanakan program yang secara nasional e, dilakukan untuk seluruh Indonesia seperti kredit yang mereka macet dilakukan relaksasi e, restructuring dilakukan terus kemudian kita memberikan bantuan sosial ya dan bagaimana kita mendorong usaha-usaha ini bisa terus berjalan. Di Jawa Tengah kita punya kegiatan... Of course it impacted their livelihood because the economy is disturbed. So when COVID entered in March 2020, we made some programs to re-energize the public, such as funding of small businesses or a national program that we help, such as relaxation on credit debt through restructuring. We gave social assistance so that these businesses can continue. In Central Java, we team up with Bank Indonesia, OJK, BUMN to train small businesses and connect them to the marketplace, including those that have become unicorn. If previously they sold their products in a traditional way, now we ask them to migrate to the digital space. So now they can sell their products digitally. And of course, this process is still going on. For the, big, for the bigger industry, we have invited investors who have previously invested in Central Java but got halted. The industry in Batang is now in operation, so now the big names have already entered. We hope in the next year when the big... We hope in the next year when the industry is starting, labor will be absorbed and the economy will rise in those places, such as Batam. Industri itu mulai bisa dibangun, harapan kita tenaga kerja mulai terserap dan ekonomi mulai tumbuh di beberapa titik ini yang saya contohkan di kawasan industri Batam. Oh ya. Yeah. Begitu Kevin and Jeff. Ya, yeah, terima kasih. Ya, yeah. yeah, baik sekali. Uh, harus saya pakai bahasa Inggris. I was hoping you could talk to me about the story you tell foreign investors about your province. I understand uh, si there are significant Singaporean investments in central Java. 
So you are meeting with some success. I was wondering if you could convey to me your sales pitch for your province. Kalau kita bicara bagaimana kondisi yang ada di Jawa Tengah untuk investasi, memang Jawa Tengah cukup menarik. Yang pertama, lahan cukup terbuka, kawasan industri baru juga muncul, dan beberapa investor mulai masuk. Untuk kawasan industri seperti di Kendal, kita kerjasama memang dengan uh, Singapura waktu itu. Dan untuk investasi tertinggi masih dari Jepang. Kemudian yang kedua ada uh, Korea. Ya. Ini dua negara yang hari ini masih mendominasi. Dan Singapura juga cukup bisa dominan di apa beberapa sektor antara lain. When we talk about Central Java in terms of investment, the province is quite interesting. First, the land is quite open. There are emerging industrial zones and some investors have already set foot. For some industrial zones in Kendal, we had a partnership with Singapore. The highest investment still comes from Japan and Korea. The two countries still dominate. And Singapore has quite significant investment like in Kendal. The other interesting factor is that it's quite conducive. There aren't that many agitation in the public. Probably that's different from other areas. And when it comes to labor wages, it's competitive. This is what's pushing for investment here. When it comes to regulation, we give a lot of relaxation so that investors can invest their capital easily in Central Java. That's what's interesting about Central Java that probably can sway investors. Uh, Pat Gobernor, speaking about competitiveness, that's partly about pricing, but also uh, about uh, human resources uh, uh, and uh, skills. Can you uh, discuss uh, efforts by the provincial government to increase uh, human capital in, in the province? Oh iya, kalau berkait dengan keterampilan, sebenarnya banyak perguruan tinggi, apalagi yang vocational school, cukup banyak di Jawa Tengah. Kita juga punya sekolah kejuruan ya, level menengah yang ada. Jadi kami pernah menawarkan kepada beberapa perusahaan untuk mendesain secara bersama-sama kebutuhan tenaga kerja yang terampil, yang sesuai dengan spesifikasi yang dibutuhkan oleh perusahaan itu. Maka kami menawarkan pada perusahaan berapa tenaga kerja yang dibutuhkan. When it comes to skills, there are many high schools, especially vocational schools in Central Java. So we have offered to some companies to design collectively the need for skilled laborers tailored to the specification of their industry. So we ask the companies how many labors they are needed. We have the vocational schools and we can design the curriculum to help it. And we want their industry to become teaching industry so that schools can work with companies in creating skilled workforce from the get-go. We open ourselves to it so that Central Java can supply skilled workforce. Okay. Governor, I, I wanted to ask you about something a little bit more nationally focused. There is an ambition for Indonesia to become one of the world's biggest economies by, I think, 2040, 2050, number four in the world. As you were the governor of Central Java, from your vantage point, from your experience, what are some of the obstacles and the challenges you think will need to be addressed in order for that to be achieved? Uh, jadi tantangan kita untuk menuju Indonesia 2045 ada beberapa hal. Yang pertama hari ini kami harus bisa menyelesaikan bonus demografi. Karena bonus demografi itu sudah terjadi di Jawa. Ada Jawa Barat, ada Jawa Tengah, ada Jawa Timur, bonus demografinya sudah terjadi. Maka tugas kami adalah memberikan pendidikan yang terbaik kepada mereka agar mereka bisa uh, menyiapkan dirinya untuk menjemput masa depan yang jauh lebih baik. Dan itu tentu saja salah satu tadi yang kita sampaikan adalah bekerja sama dengan industri sehingga ini betul-betul bisa fit, bisa sesuai dan itu akan menuju target yang ada. Ini tantangan sumber daya manusia. Yang kedua, tentu tantangan lingkungan hidup. Karena industrialisasi yang sedang berjalan di Jawa Tengah 
saya tidak mau nantinya lingkungan atau isu lingkungan akan mengemuka karena kita salah mengelola. Maka kami hati-hati betul dalam melakukan kontrol terhadap investasi yang berpotensi mencemari lingkungan. Maka green economy, green industry sekarang menjadi perhatian kami. Agar uh, sustainable development-nya bisa kita uh, kendalikan dan ini akan bisa menuju tahun 2045. Jadi uh, masalah SDM yang kedua tantangan berikutnya. There are some obstacles to reach it by 2045. First, right now we have to deal with demographic bonus because it already happened in Java. Our job is to supply them with the best education so they can have a better future. One of the way to do so is through partnership with industry. This is a problem about demographic. Secondly, it's about the environment. I don't want the industrialization that is happening in central Java will cause environmental problems in the future because of our mismanagement. That's why we are very concerned about control of the investment that can potentially cause environmental hazard. Green economy and green industry are our main focus so we can maintain the sustainable development goals until 2045. Thirdly, of course, our international partnership, especially with our allies, which we hope can be mutually beneficial. So, this collaboration can push Indonesia to become the largest economy, whether it's the fourth or the seventh, as predicted by McKenzie or PricewaterhouseCooper. This is our concern. This means we have to prepare for future industry. As the president has said, we have to jump into the battery industry. We have prepared for it at Central Java, We also have to start getting into the digital industry. We have to prepare the labor and the related industry. Not to mention that innovation and creation still have to continue. Uh, an issue that has come up at the central government level uh, pertains to a carbon tax. That's a policy recently announced. I know that's a central government policy, not a provincial one, but uh, maybe uh, you nonetheless uh, have a take on it because it, it is uh, something that's receiving a lot of discussion and It's uh, something important for the environment, but can also affect uh, uh, people directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saya kira penting betul itu. Sebenarnya carbon trade sendiri juga sudah berjalan cukup lama. Dan yang penting mesti dilakukan hari ini tidak hanya sekedar pajak karbon, tapi carbon trade mesti dilakukan dengan banyak negara. Karena Indonesia sebagai paru-paru dunia, kalau kita melakukan konservasi dan bumi, planet bumi, manusia yang ada di atas yang membutuhkan itu, memang harus ada sharing. Maka kalau kemudian kita sudah bisa menghitung itu, rasa-rasanya Kementerian Luar Negeri, Duta Besar kita yang ada di luar negeri, juga harus menegosiasikan itu. Maka kalau itu tidak tercapai, karbon trade tidak terjadi, maka pajak karbon menjadi penting untuk kita pakai mencegah agar kemudian kondisi bumi kita ini menjadi I think it's important. Carbon trade has been going on for some time. What should be done is not just carbon tax, but carbon trade with many other countries. I think the foreign ministry and our diplomats have negotiated that. So if that's not accomplished, if carbon trade doesn't happen, then carbon tax becomes significant in preventing it so that our earth's condition can improve significantly. So when we talk about helping the environment, carbon tax is important. Carbon tax is important in keeping our environment clean. Because, Kevin, we have a problem here in central Java, especially in the north coast. Some areas have the potential to become a sinking area. Some areas even have already been submerged. One, because of rising sea level and two, because of land subsidence. This is why we have to keep the balance of things, and we have to recover them in some places, because it can become a significant environmental problem later on. When you mention uh, reforestation uh, efforts, uh, does that uh, pertain also to mangroves uh, along the coastline near Samara? Ya, Kevin, ini betul sekali. Pertanyaan apa Kevin menurut saya uh, bagus, maka kami bekerja juga dengan beberapa perusahaan yang mereka punya uh, semangat, spirit untuk menjaga lingkungan. Maka sampai dengan hari ini kita betul-betul melakukan satu reforestasi dengan tanaman bako dan beberapa hutan mangrove itu cukup berhasil ya. Kita lakukan penanaman ada di Brebes, ada di Pekalongan, ada di Jepara, di sisi selatan ada di Cilacap, 
Dan ini memang terus kita uh, dorong agar land subsidence apa, bisa kita kurangi begitu. Memang di beberapa tempat kami melakukan secara artificial, umpama di sepanjang pantai yang ada di kabupaten dan kota Pekalongan, kami membuat yes, we cooperate with companies who have the spirit to protect the environment. Right now we are doing a reforestation effort with mangroves and it's quite successful in Brebes, Pekalongan, and Jepara. In the south, we have Fetin Celacap and we push it so that we can reduce land subsidence. In some areas, we do it artificially. For example, in Pekalongan's beach, we built a dike. Because this dike will solve the short-term problems. The long-term solution is planting mangrove. We also cooperate with some universities and the Netherlands government. Even the Prime Minister, Mark Wright, visited here and spoke with me. He wanted to help with the supplies, but it takes more significant research. Because when we went to Rotterdam, we shared our problems of land subsidence. We exchanged ideas with Rotterdam, Caracas, and San Francisco. We all have the same experience in fighting land subsidence. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, shift to talking about uh, clean governance, uh, if possible. Uh, in, in the past, uh, a common refrain from investors was that local level officials would perpetrate extortion type practices and this was uh, an impediment to investment and development but uh, it seems that that's improving in central java and uh, what has happened uh, uh, with regards to making uh, central java more investor friendly with regards to uh, clean governance sebenarnya cerita good governance dan clean government menurut saya menjadi isu yang selalu dibawa oleh kepala daerah pada saat kontestasi Dan saat itu saya membawa isu ini dan menjadi tagline saya. Jadi tidak korupsi dan tidak menipu. Tidak korupsi itu betul-betul menjadi isu yang pada saat saya mau running gubernur itu ternyata disukai oleh masyarakat dan mereka berharap betul pemerintah ini bersih. Yang kedua adalah tidak menipu karena banyak janji politik yang seringkali tidak terlaksana. Maka cerita tidak korupsi dan tidak menipu menjadi tagline saya. Uh, kami terjemahkan, uh, kami tuliskan dalam bahasa Jawa. <laughs> Mungkin menarik untuk disampaikan namanya boten korupsi dan boten ngapusi. Itu artinya tidak korupsi dan tidak menipu dalam bahasa Jawa. Ya. Nah, pada saat itu Kevin, kami memulai setelah kami terpilih, maka tindakan pertama saya adalah uh, mengimplementasikan itu. Saya mulai dari tindakan sederhana sekali saat itu. Silakan Anda melaporkan harta kekayaan kepada KPK dan kami yang mengumpulkan. Dan dimulai dari saya dulu. Maka pada saat kemudian kita tampilkan ke publik, inilah harta saya. Yang kedua baru saya sampaikan, setelah ini tidak ada lagi cerita e, bawahan staff memberikan setoran kepada atasan. Dan tidak ada lagi cerita atasan meminta komisi kepada bawahan. Kalau itu terjadi, silakan lapor ke saya dan saya kasih ini nomor handphone saya. Kalau publik melihat, lalu saya kasih uh, uh, akun medsos saya. Saya cukup aktif di Twitter, di Facebook, di Instagram, cukup aktif. Dan kemudian itu menjadi... Good and clean governance is a recurring issue brought up by officials during election. I brought this issue and it became my tagline. No corruption, no deception. When I ran for governor, the public loves the idea of no corruption, and they really wish for a clean government. The second one is no deception, because there were many political promises that often did not come to fruition. So that was our tagline. We wrote it in Japanese. Boten korupsi, boten ngapusi. At the time after being elected, I was implementing that. I started from a simple act. I asked for officials to report their wealth to the KPK and start with me. Then we released the report to the public so they can see it. After doing so, I declared for the future that there will be no more scenarios in which officials give money to their superiors. No more stories of superiors asking for money to their inferiors. If such a thing happens, people can contact me directly to my phone number. They can also do so via social media accounts as well. I'm quite active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. They become the media for the public to report such misconduct. When I ran for governor, 
the issue of selling seats was a concern. That's why I guarantee that anyone working as civil servants can become so through open recruitment with a fair competition, and I will be the guarantor. Around 2014, the public complained about illegal fees. That's why in 2014 there was an article about me getting angry in the Jembatan Timba because there was an info from the people that illegal fees were conducted there. After checking on the location, it is confirmed that such practice happened. That was the momentum for change. I changed the direction there and fired some people involved. I have to see whether this was happening in other sectors. Later, I found that there were some of my staff who sold seats and ranks and asked for illegal fees in procurement. We followed it up with a changing in staffs. I fired the head of the department there. It caused a significant deterrent effect, but even then, in seven years, imagine that, there were still some of my staff who repeated such things, and this is the head of the department, so I fired him. Then they can see that I'm being serious about it. Next step is to bring such measure to regency and city level. Today, anyone who was treated badly by public servants by being asked for illegal fees can now have the courage to report such practices via social media or via apps that we have prepared. It's called Lapor Group. It helps us to check on the reports and it will help us with our decision making. That's the story of corruption in Central Java and that's how we handle it. Jawa Tengah dan pengalaman kami menangani ini, Kevin. Uh, when you were making these uh, efforts regarding clean governance, did you find enough supportive uh, efforts by other agencies and entities, both at the central government and at the, and the regional government level? Oh yeah, ini ini pertanyaan bagus juga ini Kevin dan Jeff. <coughs> Jadi apakah mendapatkan dukungan awal-awal tidak? Hari ini ya saya merasakan ada yang mendukung penuh, tapi ada yang ya hanya lip service saja. Maka kami mengundang uh, KPK untuk kita bersama-sama melakukan pencegahan korupsi dengan koordinasi supervisi pencegahan tadi programnya. Yang kedua, kami mulai mengajak uh, KPK, para bupati, wali kota, dan para kepala sekolah termasuk guru-guru untuk kita menandatangani komitmen dan melakukan pendidikan anti korupsi uh, melalui sekolah-sekolah. Dan inilah yang pertama kali kita lakukan dengan seluruh bupati wali kota. Selebihnya, bagaimana prospek ke depan? Prospek ke depan akan dipengaruhi. In the beginning, it wasn't supported. Right now, there are those who support it and those who are only doing a lip service. That's why we team up with KPK to create the prevention and supervision program. We also ask KPK, mayors, regents, headmasters, and especially teachers to sign an agreement in giving an anti-corruption lessons via schools. For the future prospect, it depends on the leadership of each regions. Our next aim is after doing so at provincial level, we want to repeat it at local level. It is really hard, but KPK support is very significant, and we always keep pushing for it. The public supported this, of course. They're grateful that they can get the best service from the government. I always say this to my staffs. The measure of our work is the public satisfaction. The indication to measure our service is that it has to be easy, cheap, and fast. That's the qualitative measure that the public can fill. So if the public complains, you can see from my social media that it's the form of public control to us. I hope that officials feel that they are being watched by the public so that they will avoid corrupt or manipulative measures. Because with social media, public control is getting better. I hope it gets better in the future. Karena kontrol publik makin ketat dengan adanya teknologi digital dan media sosial ini. Maka kalau saya melihat prospek ke depan, uh, mudah-mudahan jauh lebih baiklah begitu. Well, uh, discussing about the social media and addressing uh, governance um, alongside the KPK, let's, uh, based on an assumption that the KPK is not going to be performing uh, in the future as it has in the past, uh, will that oversight by social media and uh, public scrutiny be sufficient? Uh, 50-50. Yeah, kalau KPK tidak berperan, Kevin, dan hanya dikontrol oleh publik, tidak akan pernah terjadi perubahan itu. Pasti ini akan kembali pada cara-cara lama, cara-cara pemerintahan yang tidak transparan, tidak pernah akuntabel, dan pasti koruptif, begitu. 
Maka kontrol publik itu bagian dari edukasi bagaimana uh, pelayan publik ini mesti dikontrol juga, dibuka, dipermalukan oleh publik kadang-kadang begitu, karena banyak di antara mereka seringkali merekam. Nah, uh, sampai dengan hari ini saya masih percaya karena kami masih punya kerjasama dengan uh, KPK dan KPK masih menjadi lembaga yang ditakuti, masih menjadi lembaga yang ditakuti. Sehingga uh, if the KPK has no role and we simply have to rely on the public, there will be no change. It will return to a time of old governance, one that is not transparent or accountable, and most definitely corrupt. Public control is part of education on how these public officials must be watched. Sometimes they were named and shamed by the public. Right now we still have trust in the KPK, and they are still a feared agency. I still have high hopes that good and clean governance can still be implemented. But we can rely simply on one of them, be it just KPK or especially if it's just the public. Because there's no power to punish them. You can talk to public officials and ask them about KPK. It can still bring fear into their eyes. KPK is still an institution we have high hopes for in this country. Oke, okay, baik ya. Terima kasih itu pemandangan yang menarik dan sangat berguna. Uh, Jeff, uh, you have one now? Yeah. Uh, pa, um, this is a strange time for you. There is a lot of media coverage and some of it uh, you may not like. I was wondering about your feeling during this time, about the speculation of your future plans your relationships with the party how is that affecting you sebenarnya kalau Jeff dan Kevin membaca berita terakhir sebagai anggota partai politik dari PDI Perjuangan itu dinamika yang biasa-biasa saja buat saya saya merasa itu peristiwa yang tidak terlalu mengganggu saya dalam pekerjaan saya dan di PDI Perjuangan dinamika seperti ini seringkali terjadi. Tapi kalau kemudian kita e, bicara apa yang kemarin cukup ramai di media masa, kalau orang anggota partai PDI Perjuangan semua sudah tahu bahwa kami harus melakukan pekerjaan sesuai dengan tugas kami masing-masing, yang jadi gubernur, jadi bupati, jadi wali kota, jadi anggota DPR, begitu, silakan saja kerja baik-baik. Di situ tidak perlu memikirkan yang lain Karena kalau keputusan-keputusan berkaitan dengan kontestasi dan lain sebagainya If we're talking about what's quite viral in the media All PDIP party officials already know That we have to do our own portion of work Be it as a governor, mayor, or in the parliament Do the best at your job and no need to think of anything else Because the decision in regards to candidates for higher office falls to our party leader. I think every party official knows, and I'm not too worried. This isn't the first time I responded to it, and I'm not too worried about this issue. Okay. 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 Governor, just to get sort of a, sort of a, a sense of you personally, um, what do you do to relax? What's your favorite Netflix program, for example? Uh, enggak, enggak, saya jarang uh, Biasanya saya kalau apa santai lebih lebih sering berolahraga. Saya berkeliling tiap hari ke banyak kampung-kampung, ke jalan-jalan dengan naik sepeda. Dan itu yang saya usually for leisure I do exercise. I cycle through some villages. That's what I love the most. It's kind of rare for me to watch TV at home. Maybe once in a while I turn on HBO. Nonton HBO. HBO. Oh, very HBO. high quality. It just relaxes. Okay. Hebat. Okay. Terima kasih Jeff, Kevin. Thank you so much ya. Ya, yeah, sama-sama Pak Gubernur. Kita sangat uh, mengapresiasikan waktu uh, Pak Gubernur.
And that's the pod. Thanks to Governor Gantra Pranova for joining us, as well as producing the show. Once again, Stephen Handoko was our translator this week, editing by Aditya Akbar, music by Blue Dot Sessions. If you're listening to us through a podcast app, please subscribe and rate us. It helps. As always, you can reach us at hello at onthelevel.id. This podcast is a production of On The Level Media. I'm Jeff Hutton. Bye for now.